Good afternoon and good evening and good morning to you wherever you are in the world and welcome to another Zoom meeting and podcast of Here's Tom with the Weather, where we investigate the plethora of higher powers that populate the vast universe of recovery, particularly where the founders of AA encourage us to find some kind of higher power, as long as it's not us. For example, in the third step of Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program, it states, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him, and also to the 11th step where it states, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And at this stage, I'm just going to ask Anne to just do a relevant reading, please, as well, from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you, David. I'm picking up on page 55. Actually, we were fooling ourselves, for deep down in every man, woman, and child, is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or another, or other, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith, faith in some kind of God was part of our makeup just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. And now I'm gonna turn back to 164. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship is right with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Thank you very much. So in this um, podcast and Zoom meeting, we speak to people with all manner of higher powers, from those who are atheists to Sufis, agnostics to Christians, Buddhists, followers of Islam, paganists, and those who subscribe to something called non-duality. We leave no stone unturned. It's our aim to promote understanding and open-mindedness so that alcoholics and addicts can find a higher power of their own to stay sober and carry the message. And just please remember at the start that this is not an AA meeting. It's just some people's version of the truth and whatever that may be. And sometimes we talk to seekers, to gurus and to people not necessarily in recovery. And today it's my honor to introduce you to someone who certainly helped to break down the walls around this alcoholic's hard heart. And that is Mr. Rupert Spira. Hello, Rupert. Hello, David. And hello, all of you. Thank you. Thank for, you. For inviting. It's great to see you. Thank you very much for coming along. And I'm just going to do a quick bio for anyone who's um, who's not familiar with Rupert. Um, Rupert Spira's pers- uh, spiritual journey started when he discovered the poetry of Rumi in 1975. Soon after, he learned mantra meditation and was introduced to the classical system of, of Advaita and non-duality. This formed the foundation of his interest and in practice for the next 25 years. During this time, he studied Ospensky, Ramana Maharshi, ran Nizagadatta Maharaj and attended Krishnamurti's last meetings at Brockwood Park. During the late 70s and early 80s, Rupert also trained as a ceramic artist and he started his first studio in 1983, making pieces that to this day can be found in private and public collections all around the world. Meanwhile, a turning point in his spiritual journey started in the mid 90s, um, which led Rupert to an American teacher Robert Adams, who died just two days after he arrived. However, while visiting, Rupert was told about another teacher called Francis Lucille, whom he met several months later. Over the next 12 years, Rupert studied with Francis, who introduced Rupert to the direct path teachings of Atmanananda Krishnamenon and the tantric approach of Kashmir Shaivism, which Francis had received from his own teacher, Jean Klein. Of these years, and I quote, Rupert writes, The greatest discovery in life is to discover that our essential nature does not share the limits nor the destiny of the body and mind. He continues to teach and spread the word about non-duality, and many of his teachings can be found on YouTube and at his website. Rupert lives in Oxford, 
uh, in, the, in England, in the UK, with his wife and family, and unfortunately is a Manchester United fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you here, Rupert. So I'm just going to kick off a few questions. I'm going to ask a few questions, then I'm going to open it up to the audience. We've got a few panel members here who are going to help out. Um, so we're all really, really keen to hear this. And, um, and I just want to say thank you very much for uh, your YouTube videos, because they certainly have opened my heart. And I'm, I'm forever grateful. And I feel very emotional about that. Thank you very much. So here's the first question. Many alcoholics become seekers because they have to, as a matter of survival, i.e. they need to get a higher power to stay sober and not kill themselves or others. It's integral to the program of AA. And I'm not sure whether that you can relate to that on your own journey, but can you give us an idea what drove you on your journey? I know there's stuff about, you said you read the poetry of Rumi, I've read that and I've heard that before, but what was the catalyst to set you on your path? Yes, David, you're right. I started reading uh, the Sufi poet Rumi when I was uh, 16 or so. Um, I became interested in the in the non-dual uh, tradition, uh, uh, particularly the way it is expressed in the Advaita Vedanta tradition from India. I learned to meditate. I, I was very interested in Ospensky's teaching and learned his movements. And so I, I was interested in these matters. But there was an event that uh, happened uh, maybe four or five years later, I, I must have been 21, which um, in response to your question specifically, what was the catalyst? This was really the catalyst. And it is really through this experience that I think I can relate at least to a degree with what you say the, the catalyst is for uh, most people in AA. It was uh, n not a. It was an experience that, that um, I'm, I'm sure almost everybody here has had. Uh, I was uh, training to be a, a ceramic artist living on the edge of Bodmin Moor, and um, I had a girlfriend. Uh, we hardly ever saw each other because of the the, the remoteness of my um, living circumstance. Um, but nevertheless, every every weekend I would we didn't have cell phones in these days in those days there wasn't even a telephone where I was training so I would mm -hmm. walk up the the hill to to the um to the local village and call her from from the phone box and and this this kind of our relationship kept me going in what was otherwise rather uh, solitary and Spartan circumstances and uh, one, one day um, I'm sure you can all relate to this. It was just all she had to say was hello, and I knew what was coming. So here, in a matter of probably a two-minute, we we had been together for um, what three years or so, and I imagined in my naivety that we would live happily ever after and have four children, and, and you know. So in a matter of two minutes, this this dream was was completely shattered, and that I, I as, as I said, I had been interested in these matters prior to this, but that, that evening, it, it took my uh, interest in these matters to a completely different level. I realized that I had allowed my happiness to be dependent on a person. And within a couple of minutes, it was gone. For me, it was a person for, for, for other, uh, we, we all have our own version of this um, story where uh, um, something that we have relied on profoundly, something objective. For many of us, it's an act, uh, a, a relationship. It could be, a, um, it could be all sorts of things, but um, when, when something that we have relied on for our peace, security, happiness is taken away. And really for the first time that evening, I asked myself, what can I rely on? What, what is a reliable source of happiness? Can I rely on anything? G given that everything is changing all the time, can I invest my desire for happiness? And like all 7 billion of us, I, I wanted happiness above all else. Can I reliably invest my desire for happiness in anyone or anything? And, and I realized that I couldn't. 
And that, that recognition, the, the recognition that, that nothing objective in my life could be a reliable source of peace and happiness was the real catalyst for me that took what up until then had been a, uh, it, it was a, a very genuine um, interest, but it, it, it took what had been perhaps more of an intellectual interest onto a new level. And I became intensely interested. What is the source of lasting peace and happiness? Right. And that's, that set you on the path. In and a big that, way. You... Well, I was already on the path, but it, it, it intensified my, my search. I, I um, made a resolution to myself that I would find out that I wanted to find out more than anything what is the source of lasting peace and happiness? And, and given that all 7 billion people love happiness above all else, this is really the, the quest that everybody is on. Everybody is seeking happiness pretty well constantly. Um, so I just want to give um, people who might have might be new to the idea of um, of non-duality, and I um, just wanted to. And I know this is a big. What is non-duality? But um, can you just give us an idea? I know it's it's not not two, and that we are all one. I guess, and that's sort of the very basic level. Can you give us a sort of a, your, your, a more of an, an insight into what those words mean? Yes, the the non-dual um, teaching really addresses. Uh, two fundamental questions or, or, or three fundamental questions in our life. Uh, the, the first is the one I've just shared with you. What is the source of lasting peace and happiness? Okay. Uh, and the, the, the second is, what is the nature of, of reality, uh, of the universe? But what, what is the nature of things and, and what is our relationship with with it and then the third question simply how should we live so these are the three existential questions how may we find lasting peace and happiness what is the nature of reality and our relationship to it and how should we live and in relation to the first question how should how may we find lasting peace and happiness the non-dual teaching suggests happiness is the very nature of our being. Happiness can never be found outside of ourself. It is the very nature of ourself. So you might ask then, well, if happiness is the nature of myself, and I am obviously always present, but why don't I experience happiness all the time? And the answer is that whilst everybody it is true has a sense of their self not everybody knows their self clearly and it is this lack of clear self-knowledge that is responsible for the veiling of the happiness that is our nature okay so that uh, for a lot of us we we have to do something called step four the step four is when we do a searching and fearless moral inventory well, for some of us anyway a searching and fearless moral inventory which is all about having a look a real look at your character defects and 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 being very concise and taking an inventory and step five okay. is is sharing that with somebody okay th th this um yes so y y your step four when you take an inventory of all, all um, the, the the qualities and characteristics that uh, make up you as a character, as a person. Mm. That, 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 is, that, that is knowledge of yourself as a, as a person, as a body and a mind. When, when the non-dual uh, teaching speaks about knowledge of ourself, it doesn't mean knowledge of our character. It means knowledge of our essential self, what, what we are essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, what we are essentially is that element of our experience that remains with us all the time. Well, obviously, no, no thought is with us all the time. No feeling, no sensation, no perception, no activity or relationship. 
So whilst all of these may be very close to us, they are not essentially what we are, that, that they are like mm. the, 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 the layers of the onion, that, that they are the, mm. they're the, they're like the clothing that we wear. Mm. Thoughts come to us, they leave us. Mm. Feelings come to us, they leave us. Sensations and perceptions come to us, they leave us. Activities and relationships appear, they disappear. So th these are like layers of experience that we, so to speak, we, we wear them, they, they appear and disappear. But mm. who is the we, who is the I that is mm. always there, the one to whom all these layers of experience appear? That, that is our essential self, essential in the sense that it's always with us, it's always who I am. And mm. if, in other words, it is just our, our essential being before it has been qualified by experience, by, by thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions. It, it is in a way like the screen, the transparent colorless screen before it is colored by a movie. So the movie in this analogy is like experience, thoughts, images, feelings, sensations, etc. cetera. The, the screen is the, the screen of awareness on which our experience plays. That, that is our essential self, just like the, the screen is the essential part of the movie. It's the only part of the movie that doesn't appear and disappear. So we're, so we're sort of separating ourselves from that screen. I mean, I know that's duality, but and we're not seeing ourselves as player on the screen. We're not actually in that screen. We're separate from that screen. What, what, what we're doing um, is in this first step, we're recognizing ourselves as the screen of awareness or the presence of awareness mm. to which all experience appears. So we recognize ourselves as the witness or the observer, mm -hmm. or the knower of the known. The known are our thoughts, images, feelings, etc. We are essentially, we are that which knows them. So in this first step, in this non-dual approach, yeah. we, we, we take a step back from the content of our experience. I am not my thoughts. I am that which knows my thoughts. I am not my feelings and sensations. I am that which is aware of my feelings and sensations. I am not my perceptions of the world. I'm that which perceives the world. So it's like, it's like taking a step back. I th previously, I thought, it, it's me, the, it's I, the body mind. It's I, this body mind that is aware of the world. Now we take a step back. We, we realize, no, it is, it is I, awareness, that is aware of the body, the mind, and the world. Yeah. yeah. So we are, not the, we are not the thinker of the thoughts. It's just we are the channel by which they occur. We are the, the, the space of awareness in which mm. the thoughts arise, and we are the, the presence of awareness with which the thoughts are known. And this is all, to, to discover this is, all, is already a tremendous liberation. You suddenly mm. realize that your thoughts and feelings, which, which, which previously you, you were completely focused of you you were at the mercy of your thoughts and feelings and after all is it not your thoughts and feelings that make you go for a drink or go for a whatever it is mm. and so previously we were so mixed up with our thoughts and feelings that we couldn't distinguish ourselves from them we felt i am my feelings we don't we don't say i experience sadness or I feel sadness, we say, I am sad. Sadness is what I am. And because we feel this complete identification with particularly with our emotions, we, 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 we then have to compensate for the feelings of sadness, loneliness, anxiety, fear, etc., through the use of substances, activities, or whatever. So here, mm. we feel the sadness, but instead of doing what or, or the loneliness, the anxiety, the fear, whatever. But instead of reaching for the substance, the activity, whatever it is to alleviate 
the discomfort of the fear. We do the opposite. We go in the opposite direction. We take a step back. We realize, no, I, I am the one that is aware of the fear. I am not the fear. Mm. I can watch my fear like I watch a movie. I mean, don't, don't, don't we all like watching terrifying movies from the comfort of our sofa? Why do we like watching terrifying movies? Precisely because we feel ourselves as this peaceful viewer on the sofa with your cup of tea it, it, uh, watching yeah. the movie. You, you feel that what happens in the movie doesn't affect me. That's why we like watching movies, because we recognize I am unaffected by it. Hmm. It's the same thing. We, we, we take a step back. We, we sit on the sofa of awareness watching not just watching the world, but watching our own thoughts and feelings. And we realize that th these are like a movie that play mm. out in front of me. I, I am free of them. Mm. I don't have to work hard to change my thoughts and feelings or to become free of them. I, I already am free of them. I just mm. need to recognize that. Mm. And e even a, um, a brief recognition of ourself as the, as the observer of our experience is tremendously liberating. Mm. It, it certainly is, and I, I just in relation to that, it's like oftentimes I think, and this is only my opinion, is that for for alcoholics or addicts, is that those emotions that you say are turned up so loud that we believe that we're those emotions, is that Absolutely. we seek external, and yes. that can be not just alcohol, it can be shopping on sex and love and hate and whatever, it's well, and politics actually, or whatever, you know? Yeah, but but even for, 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 for those people that would not consider themselves addicts, for, for, to, to substances or activities for, for most people thinking is the activity of choice through which we escape the discomfort of our feelings mm. you're, you're feeling you're feeling lonely you're feeling anxious you're feeling regretful you're feeling sorrow and yes that the, the obvious thing to do is um the the bottle the fridge uh the, the the youtube clip or but if none of these things are available you can be sure that if you start thinking if you start fantasizing about the future through this fantasy you can escape the discomfort of the feeling uh, the, the vast majority of people are addicted to thinking for this mm. reason because it provides it's cheap it's legal and it's not bad for your health <laughs> at least not overtly so. And therefore, thinking doesn't really rate on the on the level of addictive substances or activities, but it is an, an addictive activity. Mm. It is the means by which most people escape the discomfort of their feelings. Mm. So when we start out on this path of, I guess, some I've heard the words, um, well, I've practiced it, self-inquiry and stuff like that, that um, uh, Ramana Maharshi, and I know that you have a certain interpretation of that. I think it's, uh, am I aware as well as well, who am but, I? But David, what, yeah. what, th th those, sorry, I, I apologize for interruption, sure. but what I've just been doing with you, it yeah. is self-inquiry. It, yeah. it is true. It could be, I could, I could describe it in other ways and a question like, are you aware? But what I have been doing is tracing our way back to this recognition of ourself as mm -hmm. the presence of awareness. That is self-inquiry. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I, I, I comprehend that. But how is it that we can stay that knowledge? Because oftentimes what happens, and I've found it, is that I keep getting stuck. I'll come back and get stuck to the thoughts again. And then and then I'll, I'll get, you know, the, the shore goes in, the shore goes out. And, and then I'll get caught to the thought and I'll be, tra I'll be it'll lead me down the garden path and, yes. and mesmerize me again. You know, absolutely right. The, the, the thought mesmerizes you and wherever the thought wants to go, you go with it. Mm. Uh, as a result of that, for the next uh, three hours or for the next three days, mm. you are lost in the thought, in the feelings that accompany it, and if it's taken you to, 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 to the, uh, the bottle or whatever, in the sensations and perceptions. Mm. But at a certain point, you, you come to yourself, you, 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 you pause, and you remember what we've been speaking of here, and you ask yourself the question, oh yeah, but what is it that is aware of this torrent of thoughts and feelings? Mm. And that question, with that question, you take a step back, you go back onto the sofa of awareness, and you watch this mm. uh, cascade of, of thoughts and feelings. 
And this time you just remain the presence of awareness, maybe this time for a minute. And then sure enough, through force of habit, the old thoughts and feelings, uh, uh, the, the, the gravitational pull of your thoughts and feelings, they, they take you away from yourself again. But this time, you don't get lost in your feelings for three days, you get lost in your feelings for one day. Mm -hmm. And then you remember, you take yourself back. Then through force of habit, you lose yourself in experience. But this time, not for a day, it's for an hour. And then you remember again. Every time we take a step back into the seat of awareness, we are weakening the old habit of losing ourselves in the content of our experience. And it gets easier and easier both to go back to the presence of awareness, but also to remain there. So we find that we stay there for, for five minutes, for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes. And every time we go back, the, the power that experience has over us, it begins to weaken. And this is what is called becoming established in your true nature. That a, a, a time comes when the presence of awareness is not just a place in ourself that we visit from time to time. Mm. We, live, we live there. Yeah. It, it, it's, our, it's our new center. It doesn't mean to say that, that from time to time, the old habit doesn't pull us out. Sometimes we lose ourselves to the habit. Okay, it's fine. But we lose ourselves for half an hour, not three days. Yeah. Yeah, that's certainly an experience I've had recently, actually. But yeah, I've managed to pull back. And thanks to a lot of the other stuff on YouTube, which again, I highly recommend if you've not seen uh, Rupert and the YouTube, then then go and do it. I, I, I love it. Um, and there's a guy that we that a lot of us go to here um, called Paul Hederman, um, oh, who yes. does uh, non non duality. I've never, he's, I've never met Paul, but I, um, I I'm aware of Paul. Yes. Yeah, and he speaks. Obviously, there's there's a bit of a mutual respect there because he's mentioned you before as well. But he, yes. he describes as when the, the snake shed, when, when a snake sheds its skin, is that we aren't the snake. We're the we're the shedded snake skin. Which I really love that analogy. Is that you know the difference? I guess that's the way I'm interpreting the difference between our consciousness and actually awareness. And I and I that sort of that was a big again another little another little step for me. So. Yeah, great. A um, cu couple more questions that I'm going to ask everyone to, if you've got a question for Rupert, could you please relay them to Anne, Anne Kay there, and um, she's the host, just just send your, and Anne will read your questions out for you. Um, so I know we're, we're sort of, we've got another half an hour, because I'm going to just um, go through a couple of questions. Um, and these are just a few light questions for you, Rupert. <laughs> um, what is God? What is God? I know it's a, just a small question. Is there an intelligence? Is there a, is there a divine intelligence? In your opinion, is that the way you see it? Is there a divine intelligence? Is, are we living in a dream? Is, that, is there some kind of divine providence going on that's, that's making all this happen? I, I would suggest that God is our very own being. Okay. Now, for almost all people, uh, our being or our self is so thoroughly mixed up with the content of experience, as we were saying before, that there is no difference between our being and experience. Uh, our being is what we refer to when we say simply, I am. Mm. But for most people, all through their day, uh, and all through their life, they, they think or say, uh, they wake up in the morning, I am tired, I am cold, I am hungry, I am thirsty, I am late for work, I'm traveling to work, I'm talking to a friend, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm single, I'm married, I, I, I'm 22, I'm 35, I'm 47, I, I'm sick, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm impoverished. It, it's always I am. Mm plus a feeling, an activity, a relationship, or a state of mind. So this mixture of our essential self or being, I am, plus the, the qualities of experience, this amalgam of our essential being plus the qualities of experience makes for the person that we normally consider ourselves to be. Now, if, as I suggested earlier, 
we, we take off all the layers of experience. I'm not always tired. So tired is not who, I, tiredness is not what I am. I'm not always lonely. So loneliness is not essential to me. I'm not always 22 or 35 or 47. So you take off all these layers. You just get left with the I am, pure, unqualified being. And being unqualified, being has no limitations because there's nothing there to limit it. It is unlimited being or infinite being. That is God. In other words, God is the very self of each of us. But the reason we don't realize it is because we've allowed ourselves to become so entangled in the content of experience that our self seems to have become a temporary, finite, separate person. And being a fragment, this temporary, finite, separate person feels incomplete. And therefore, it's always seeking to complete itself through the acquisition of the object, the substance, the activity, the state of mind or the relationship. It's always trying to fulfill itself, not realizing that in order to find fulfillment, it must go in the other direction. It, it must not add something to itself. It must subtract everything from itself that is not essential to it. And there at the very heart of itself, God's presence shines. So all those external things are sort of real poor substitutes are, are yeah, a very, really they, poor they, substitute. They're poor substitutes, even if they give us temporary relief. Ultimately, they perpetuate the belief that we are a temporary finite self, and therefore they increase our suffering. I don't have to tell you guys about that. You, you, you all well know that taking in substances does not give you lasting peace and happiness. It just, it just numbs you from feeling the misery until the alcohol wears off then the misery comes bubbling back up again and next time you need a little bit more of the substance to have the same effect hence addiction hmm. yeah, i'm sort of starting to feel like an addict again because i've read there's so many questions i want to ask you and i'm going to open it up <laughs> after one more question so um and will you um you're fielding a few questions i'm just going to ask one more um and this is a this is again a real sort of a biggie um I've heard it described that, that life is almost like, we, and I've heard you say this, and I've, and I've kind of got my own ideas about this, but, but and I said mentioned before about life being a dream and that, that it's some kind of, you know, the film The Matrix, where there's yes. this sort of hologram, and, and I've heard you answer this before, but I'd be interested to hear you say it again, um, that we live in a, in, a, in a dream and it's sort of a projection and there's, everyone talks about quantum, blah, 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 and all that stuff. But is, is, that, your, is that your take? Are we living in this sort of, mind body five senses world which is our interpretation which isn't really what reality is if that makes sense is it yes okay yeah. okay just going back to our previous conversation i suggested mm -hmm. that what we essentially are is this infinite and unlimited being traditionally called the absolute or, or, or god now how many unlimited beings can there be they can't be two, let alone seven billion. Even if there were two, each being would have to be limited. So I would suggest, and the non-dual understanding suggests that, that there is one infinite being and that everyone and everything derives its apparently independent existence from this being. So underneath or behind the apparent multiplicity and diversity of people and things, that, that, that there lives a, um, a single unified field, a single being. Just as, for instance, if, if you're, I'm, I'm looking at my gallery view at the moment, <laughs> and I, I'm, I have a, 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 an IMAX, so it's a, a big screen, I can see um, seven by seven, I can see 49 of you. It looks as if there are 49, independently existing people i run my finger across it it's just a single indivisible screen well mm. when we look at the world we seem to see ten thousand things but those ten thousand things are the appearance of a single infinite and indivisible reality so it's not that the world is not real the world is real but its reality is infinite being, not 
temporary finite objects and selves. Brilliant, thank you very much. So I'm gonna open it up um, to the audience here. So I, I, I don't wanna take you off um, main screen there, but and I think I got a question from our mate, Frank Z. Frank Z's um, a, a, a Zen Buddhist um, leader in Northern Ireland in Belfast. And I know Frank's got a question. Could, could you please unmute uh, Frank for us, please, Anne? Yes. Hello, can you hear me okay? Hello, yeah. can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Rupert, Rupert, it's great seeing you and uh, and hearing you. That's fantastic. This is a Zen question, right? And the Zen question is, can you remember what your face was like before your parents were born? Before your parents were born? Yes. The, the, the memory of our face before our parents were born means the memory of our face before time began, which in turn means before the activity of the mind began, because all we know of time is mind. So the memory of our face is not actually a memory of something that took place in the past before our parents were born. It is the memory of something that is present now, deep inside us, behind the mind, that is behind time. It is the memory of eternity. It is the memory of our being. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Frank um, is a, a great guy and a, a, a good follower of this meeting. So thank you and very just, much, Frank. I'll just add to that, um, Frank, I'm sure you're well aware of a, of a Zen master called Ikiyu. Oh, yes. Uh, it was My favorite. Uh, your favorite. Excellent. Well, you probably know this um, quotation very well then. He, it was Ikiyu, I believe, who said that of all the koans, the koan I mm -hmm. is the most profound. What did he mean by that? That we call ourselves I all the time. If we knew what that word truly referred to, that is the most important knowledge there is. It is, I is the name we give to our face before our parents were born. And then tell me please, Whenever we practice, are we practicing non-attachment? If we practice non-attachment, Frank, that would be an activity of the mind. What I'm suggesting here is not something that we do with our mind or even something that we cease doing with our mind. What I'm recommending is the recommendation of the, the essence of our mind, the presence of awareness, irrespective of what the mind is or isn't doing. Mm -hmm. Once again, Rupert, thank you very much. And I'm, I, am, I am a recovering thinker. <laughs> Good on you, Frank, champion, <laughs> champion. Yeah. Um, so I've um, also got a, a question here from Ted Henry. Ted, do you want to ask your question, mate? And um, obviously try and try to keep it under a minute, mate. That'd be awesome. So Ted, over to you, mate. I'm going to unmute you. Hello, Ted. I'm asking you to unmute. There we go. I didn't know you would be calling on me. I, I, I'm glad I wrote it out. I thought Anne was going to be reading them. You, you just I'll, take it, I'll take this chance, though, Rupert thinks. Uh, it's a great, great privilege to be able to sit here and talk to you and listen to you. I've already learned to rethink in several ways. You said, maybe 10 minutes ago, that the vast majority of us use the addiction of thinking to avoid our feelings, negative feelings. The greatest addiction this came to me about a decade ago. The greatest addiction I have is the addiction of distraction. So I've, I phrased it differently. 
why would I want to distract myself in order to distract myself from myself was what the immediate answer was when I remember this thought coming into my head. And that leaves a thousand questions. What is it in particular, or what are all the things about me that I want to be distracted from? And so my question to you is, um, do people like me think that because we're the only ones that think we're separate from everybody else and their problems? Uh, how can a person, I mean, I, I'm, I'm doing Ramana Maharshi's self-inquiry and, and practices and drills, and I'm making some progress. But nonetheless, that underlying fear of recognizing those traits in myself that I don't care for are still pronounced. How does one move beyond that, even with all that you say and teachers say? Th thank you, Ted, for your for your question. By by recognizing that you are that which is aware of all these traits in yourself that you dislike. Now, who is saying? I don't like this particular quality about Ted. No. Is it the presence of awareness that says that? No. No. Awareness is just watching silently. It is a thought that rises up in your mind that says, I don't like this particular characteristic of Ted. So now awareness, sitting in the background, is aware of both the quality, whatever it is, the quality that that you don't like about it, and the thought that says, I don't like it. But the thought that says, I don't like, I don't like it, doesn't arise on behalf of you awareness. So the, the important thing is not to get into a dialogue with whether this particular quality or characteristic of yourself is good or bad or desirable or undesirable. How can you get rid of it? No, don't get into it. Take a step back. I am the one that is aware of it. Recognize yourself as the one that is aware of this quality. And the one that is aware of it is not judging it as good or, or bad. This might be a, a, just a little bit more of a more researched question about what you just said. But haven't I, as a student, who really wants to learn, haven't I become aware of the notion that that which you're talking about that is only aware of self doesn't know the mind-body Ted, let's say, doesn't see the mind-body Ted. So how can I sit back and see that those thoughts that are troubling to the mind-body Ted aren't who I am? I am uh, Ted, forgive me, this is probably going too deep for... Uh... No, no, it's fine, but there aren't two kinds of awareness. One, the awareness is, that is aware of your thoughts and feelings, and another special kind of awareness that is somehow further back and inaccessible, that knows nothing of your thoughts and feelings. Right, that's the one I'm it, saying. How it... It, It's the same awareness, hmm. Ted. It, it's the same way. There is only one awareness. <laughs> that, th and th that awareness is aware of the entire content of your experience, but it is not itself qualified or conditioned by any of your experience. In other words, it is free. It is independent. Above all, it is at peace. It is whole. It is complete. That's very hopeful, and I appreciate it. And, and I've probably said this once or twice before, that occasionally I feel like, forgive me for using this terminology, a spiritual schizophrenic, as I walk down the street with one's foot in the world I think is real, the mind-body reeled of Ted, and then occasionally I put my little toe into the world of what you're talking about the supreme awareness and that it, it confuses me every time i think of it quite that way ted you're making a a, a a separation between yourself ted and this 
supreme awareness. Let, let me give you an, an analogy. Imagine some of you who've watched my, David will be familiar with this, any of you that have watched my YouTube clips. It's, it's an analogy that I use quite often because it's very powerful. It's the analogy of an actor called John Smith who plays the part of King Lear in, in, in Shakespeare's play. Now, John Smith lives alone. He's, he's, he leads a, a quiet, peaceful, contented life at home. But when he goes to his theater, he adopts the character of King Lear, puts on King Lear's clothes, uh, uh, adopts his thoughts and feelings. And to all intents and purposes, he becomes the character King Lear, but without ever really ceasing to be John Smith. Now, in the form of King Lear, John Smith is miserable. He's always arguing with his daughters. He's at war with the French, etc. And he's always trying to alleviate his unhappiness by um, eating too much, drinking too much, uh, etc. Et and then one day he meets a friend who is, is, uh, has an interest in, in these matters. And, and his friend says to uh, King Lee, no, you're not miserable because of your daughters and the French. You're miserable because you've You've forgotten who you are. Who are you behind your thoughts and feelings? In other words, he's teaching King Lear self-inquiry. And King Lear traces his way back to himself. And at some stage, there is this recognition, I am John Smith. And at that moment, his suffering comes to an end. Now, the, what is the, is there a clear distinction between John Smith and King Lear? Is, is King Lear one person and John Smith another person? There's only one person there. It's John Smith. And King Lear is just an, an imaginary temporary limitation of John Smith. So in other words, the, the, the being of King Lear is really the being of John Smith. Well, John Smith in this analogy represents God's infinite being or, or awareness. And King Lear represents the person. Now, so you as the person, Ted, are King Lear, the character. Mm -hmm. But the self in yourself, the very being of yourself, the awareness with which you are aware of your experience doesn't belong to a person. It is, it is infinite awareness. Mm -hmm. There's no separation between you and that awareness. The very awareness now with which you are aware of your experience is the same universal awareness with which everybody is aware of their experience. That's enormously helpful. I just want to wrap this up by saying I never thought of it quite that way before. Through all my muddled trying to explain where I am in my own head, you saw this as the right answer, and it's the answer I've never thought of before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. Nice to meet you. I wish you the Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ted. So we've got a few questions now from the audience and we've got some panel members here. So first of all, um, and we've got about, say, 25 minutes left before Rupert has to go and uh, watch watch his team or something or go and watch a bit of telly, put his feet up for the night. Um, I'm going to go to Kaiser. I know Kaiser's got a nice question as it relates to the 12 steps. Over to you, Kaiser, mate. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rupert. Kaiser. Hello. I'm an alcoholic. Um, and as an alcoholic... I've used the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to take me from catastrophe and not being able to function as, as, a, as a human being really into a release where I, where I can. And I'm finding myself a lot of times being okay. Um, and with our 12 steps, we use a power that's greater than ourselves. Some people call that God. And I use that terminology. Um, and I've also experienced and been called to a non-dual perspective and non-duality for a couple decades now. And non-duality seems to be quite ambiguous about a higher power or God. My instincts will not allow me to risk the beautiful life that I have by going into this, I am God. Um, and I pray and I don't know what it's all about, but I know that using a power greater than myself gives me release, gives me relief. My question is the using of a higher power to, to help me with recovery and live a more full life. 
um, beyond my separate sense of self that you were kind of talking about. How does that, is that beneficial in general? I mean, I know it's beneficial, but how, how do you use this, we are actually God, and at the same time, still use a sense of a higher power? Because for me, that's non-negotiable in, in my, my experience. Yes. Hmm. Kaiser, I would suggest that the, the, the higher power is, as you rightly say, something higher, greater, larger than you as an individual person, but it is also the essence of you as an individual person. The, 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 this higher power, sometimes called God, is infinite being. It is the, the reality of everything. Being the reality of everything, it is your reality. It is who you really are. So it is both utterly intimate to you, but it is much bigger than your limited personality. So it, there's no contradiction between the idea of a higher power, which is infinitely larger than you as a person, but is also the essence of you as that person. Now, if you don't feel that the essence of yourself is this infinite being, in other words, if you feel that I, I am a, a, a separate person, then obviously this higher power will be projected outside of yourself. And that's fine if, 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 that's, if, if that's your experience. But at some stage, I would encourage you to, to feel that this higher power is not only infinitely vaster than you as a person, but is actually the very self of you as a person. But, but both the totality of what you are on the inside and also the totality of the universe on the outside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kaiser. Cheers, Kaiser. Thank you very much, mate. Um, and again, thank you for all your support to this meeting. So I'm going to go to my mate, Professor Paul. I think you can unmute yourself there, Paul. I know um, Paul's one of the hosts and panel members on this. Uh, oh, uh, am I unmuted, Dave? Yeah, you go for it, mate. Yeah, go OK, on. thank you. Um, uh, Rupert, um, it's, it's great to meet you. And uh, I, I, I'm someone well, who... You think um, I'm, oh, I don't know. I've got glasses on and I've got a bookcase behind me. I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> All right, keep, keep going. I'll find you. Okay. Um, I, I've, I've not really listened to what you've got to say before on YouTube or anything, but um, I am finding myself absolutely aligned with everything that you are saying. And, uh, and I just loved what you had to say then about the idea of a higher power because, you know, my... my I'm not sure it were a question exactly, but you were talking about the you know God as the infinite, and um, and Kaiser mentioned that you know we, we we have a tendency in AA to call this infinite thing God. If it is infinite, then it's clearly as much a part of me, and I am as infinite as it is, and uh, I am as universal as it is. But the I which I'm referring to there is really, um, it's, um, it's the global subjective, in a sense. When, when I dwell in the global subjective, rather than constantly trying to objectify my experience and the objects of the world and those, all of those relationship issues you know i am in this relationship i am 22 and all of those other things that you listed which are a common part of everyone's existence i'm falling into the trap of thinking that that socialized iconography which i've been which has been hammered into me throughout my life as, as with all of us you know and okay we all have different cultures and different genders and all kinds of other things but all of those all of those are kind of objects within that social iconography. And for me, this kind of, the practice of meditation is ultimately to kind of, it's, it, 
it's it's about relinquishing all of that iconography so for me to think of higher power even though i have been a member of AA for nine well 20 years over 20 years now um, to think of something higher is to fall into the trap of the iconography mm -hmm. and you know what 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 you're helping to release me from is 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 the kind of um <laughs> I, I guess a kind of hangover of guilt and shame attached to the idea, another part of the iconography, of pride, arrogance, and so on and so forth. When we relinquish this, this objectivity and just allow the subjective experience, that which has always been there, it was very interesting when you were talking about, I didn't know what um, our friend were on about when he asked the question about your face before your mother and father existed. But then when you kind of, when you talked about the temporal and the spatial, they also are a part of that iconography, you know what I mean? And because we sense those things, we can't help but think that they are real. And they're the things that we can, that the global subjective keeps coming back to over and over again, day after day after day, whilst we're, you know, in this glorious life of ours, you know. For me, though, when we when we move out of that and into, I'm sorry for going on too long, I have nearly finished. Um, <laughs> when, when I when I relinquish that objectivity, just be, just accept my subjectivity as not only the screen, but the projector, the light that emits from the projector onto the screen, and actually see the imagery on the screen as something which is kind of it's a co-production between that self which is, you know, that socialised self and the rest of the bloody human race constantly telling me, this is the movie, this is reality, you know, and constantly impressing that. It's a very difficult thing to maintain one's relinquishing, I think, and not keep getting attached back into it, you know. But on a, on a daily basis, I, I, I try. I just keep trying. I just keep trying to keep relinquishing, you know. Um, Sorry, that wasn't a question, Warrior. It was just, wow. it was just an ego flight. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks for being there, Rupert, though. Anyway, that's Thank fantastic. You. And if you do have an answer, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Paul. You. Cheers, mate. I hope everything's going all right in uh, Wales, waiting out the apocalypse down there. Well done, yeah. mate. Um, so, Rupert, I'm just going to read a question here I've got from uh, my friend Michael Stacey, who's in um, Madeira in California. And Michael says, hi, Rupert. Is it a fair assessment to say that when I'm in the activity of being identified as a mind body, this is what is creating my suffering? Thank you very much, Michael. Hello, Michael. In short, the answer to your question is yes. When you, awareness, or you, infinite being, identify yourself with a, a, a mind and a body, you limit yourself. You become a fragment. And as that fragment, you feel incomplete. And feeling incomplete, you always feel you have to complete yourself by acquiring something or someone, uh, the bottle, the fridge, the relationship, the, whatever it is for, 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 for each of us. So, so yes, the identification of yourself with something limited, that is a body and a mind, is, yes, the source of your suffering. And ultimately, the only way out of suffering is to disidentify oneself with the mind or the body, or in other words, recognize that you are prior to that, 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 that you are the presence of awareness prior to the, the body and the mind, and that you are not limited by it, that that is what is called the, the, the direct path to peace and happiness. It's direct in the sense that we go directly to the source of happiness, which is our being, rather than going to peace and happiness via objective experience. So, but yes, the answer to your question is yes. The identification of ourself with the contents of our experience is the cause of suffering. Yes. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for that. Thank you very much, Rupert. Um, I'm just going to quick, one of our co-hosts here just wants to say a quick hello. Lebowski, do you want to say hello, mate? Uh, yes, of course, I'd love to say hello. Um, I don't want to take the place of a uh, legitimate question. Um, oh, there you are. Because, you. Yeah. 
How are you doing? I already know people that have flown across the world and you've addressed time and death with them. So I really don't have a question on par with any of that. <laughs> I, I do want to say though that um, you were saying three days, three weeks, whatever, like 30 years, um, you know, the that whole body mind uh, suffering thing um, and reaching outside for something objective uh, ran things. And uh, you were my first introduction to, to a, a, another idea outside of that. And um, gosh, I remember so much confusion at first. And, um, and so I followed back to uh, Francis Lucille and then Jean Klein and I was like, at some point, this stuff has to get basic enough for me to understand it. Yeah. Um, the journey ended up back with you uh, and uh, David showing me the video that you did with um, with a fellow that was at one of your talks about the the time of death, time and the time of death. And and it's just, I just want to say thank you because um, Every now and then, when 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 a when a fellow like you are, is speaking, I get that sense of um, not being limited to James, but also knowing that whatever it is that's not limited to James is totally cool with James. Absolutely, yes. And 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 not just James um, on a like or a happy. But yes, all of James. The whole range of James. The whole range of James. Oh wow! And there's so much yes. peace in that. Um, moment, you know, I don't abide in it, but I'm always grateful for it. So thank you very much. Thank you, James. Love you, brother. Very best. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, James. So listen, we're, we're into the final straight here. So Rupert's time is very precious. So I'm going to shut up. We've got three more questions. I'm going to go to Kurt. I'm going to go to Marty. Then we'll finish off with Donal. Okay, Kurt, over to you, mate. Over in, uh, over in America there. Hey, mate. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Rupert, for showing up in, uh, in the meeting today. In our text, one of our texts, the big book, it says, and you, you, you had mentioned this, it says, actually, we were fooling ourselves. Um, Anne read this. For down, deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. Yes, exactly. Yes. And well, I'm, I'm referencing it to Kaiser's question. Uh, well, this is all inter this is all interrelated. In what's been talked about, but I, I, mean, I was taught originally from a native perspective. And one of the things I say a lot is, "Thy will is being done." Mm -hmm. That expression of everything is an expression of that will. The tree. This is how they. This is how they say, you you come in a in a sweat lodge. You come out and you talk to the stone brothers that are coming in. You would talk to your relatives, the two legged, the four legged, the wing ones. So there's a recognition in this. This is not intellectual. Yeah. It's a very it's a very revelatory experience, a kind of a breakthrough, that happens through collapse, calamity, whatever. But. Um, I think, and this has been my experience with coming into AA and really, really diving into this, it's brought me to non-duality. This 12-step process has brought me to non, the non-dual perspective. Yes. So yes. Um, I just really appreciate, one of, one of your talks that you did was a, a guy was having a conversation with you about a lamp. And do you remember this? And you said- Remind me, no. <laughs> no, well, he said, he said, I, I see the lamp and he's, you, you said, can I pounce on you for a moment? And he, and what you were referencing was he thought he was seeing a lamp, but what he was aware of is his, no his, his knowing you were backing him up. Yes. Yes. I see. Yes. Could, could you speak on that a little bit? I mean, you have been, but but that was just a great that was a great talk. Yes, I, I don't. Is it, sorry, is it Kurt or Chris? Kurt. Kurt. Kurt yeah, Kurt. I don't. I don't remember. Um, I don't remember the the, the, the talk. So I, it's difficult for me to. And I haven't quite got the hang of the conversation. So I, I I can't really comment on that. But I, so I'm going to go back a, a little bit further to to what you said about um. 
thy will be done. The, 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 the thy will is the only will that is being done. And, and you're right, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right, because if the being of, of each of us is God's being, mm -hmm. and if the being of each of us is the only being there is, the being from which everyone and everything derives its apparently independent existence, then God's being is the only being there is. There, there isn't another being mm -hmm. who could either be willing something to happen or not. In, in a way, it, it is the arrogance of the separate self that considers it to be self alongside God's being, albeit a very small, finite self. To, to, to believe that there is room in God's being for, for anything other than God's being is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is, it's not blasphemy to say, I am God, although it, one should never say that. It's, it doesn't sound, mm -hmm. one should not <laughs> say that. But what is really blasphemous is to say, I am a separate self. I am a temporary finite being, because that sets oneself up as an, as an independent being, a being that has independence from God. And if there are, if there are, if there is another being apart from God's being, let alone seven billion of them, then God's being cannot be infinite. So you're, you're right. God's being, if, if, if we're happy, and all of you are with, with, the, with the word, I, I'm so glad to be able to use the word God without being apologetic about it. <laughs> so if, if God's being is the, is, is, is the only being there is, is infinite being, then yes, that infinite being is, is the, the only one that is doing anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So sorry, um, Kurt, I haven't responded to the um, question you asked because I, I, I didn't remember the conversation you were referring to, but, but I'm glad to have had the opportunity to, to, to refer to your, your first point. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kurt. And uh, Kurt will be um, our main speaker next week. Kurt holds satsangs himself okay. over in uh, the United States, and he's going to do a really great talk next week. We're hoping. I'm sure he will be because he's a great guy, and I, I really love his... Uh, his, his wisdom as well. So listen, we're right into the final straight here. So we're gonna have to be quick. I know Liam's had his hand up. So before we go to Marty, Liam, have you just got a quick question, mate? I'm sorry, we're running out of time, mate. I'm asking you to unmute. Hi. How, how are you? Uh, yeah. greetings, greetings from Galway in Ireland. You know, my, my question was, um, um, I, after many years of inquiry, Rupert, and I'm just, <clears throat> privileged to, to be in your presence, really, I am, and for everybody else as well here, you know. But uh, I am, um, and I can uh, relate to your kind of uh, rejection uh, when you were young, uh, very similar experience to my own, you know. And um, maybe I've never gotten over it, you know. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's just that um, I, I, I read uh, Joel Goldsmith back many years ago, you know, and yeah. Joel just to say, he, he is nearer than breathing, closer than hands and feet. You know, he is, my God is my sufficiency in all things, perfects that, perfecting that which concerns me, performing that which I find me yeah. to do. I would have all the words, and even the last line in the prodigal son, which I kind of identify with so well, is that son, he says, you're always with me, and all I have is yours, you know. And um, I would be into, I have been into Nizer Gadat, and I even just downloaded a, a book by, by that Jean Don uh, translated. Just sorry, Liam, it. mate. Sorry, Liam, mate. Have you got a question? Because we we are running out of you time. Know, it's, I know. Just, yeah. it's, it's just this this notion of kind of the disappointed me not being able to kind of you know to relate to an impersonal a consciousness. How can a, a personal consciousness relate to an impersonal consciousness? That's the question, basically. Thank you, Liam. The there is no personal consciousness. The, the very consciousness with which you are currently conscious or aware of your experience is unlimited. Everything you are aware of is limited. But that which is aware of it is unlimited and as such impersonal. In other words, the, the very essence of yourself that Joel Goldsmith referred to as being closer to you than your breathing, more essential to you than your most intimate thoughts and feelings, that is impersonal, aware being. Okay. 
right now, what you essentially are is impersonal, unlimited awareness. Your, the thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions that you are aware of are all limited. But that which is aware of them in the background is unlimited. That is your true nature. And its nature is peace and joy. That is the place of peace, the place of happiness. If you want happiness, that is the way to go into the depths of your being. That's where joy lives. That's where peace lives. <clears throat> nice to meet you, Liam. Thank you very much. Marty. Thanks, David. Ben Rupert, thanks for being here. I'm not even sure if I should ask a question after your last response, because that kind of pretty much encapsulated everything. But in the beginning, you talked about three aspects of non-duality, the third of which was living our day-to-day -day life. But you didn't quite expand on that, or if you did, I didn't hear it. The way yeah, no, I, I didn't get that far. <laughs> so I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, let me just say, uh, very briefly and very succinctly about that. It's, and I'm gonna quote St. Augustine because I, I really can't improve on what he said. Somebody asked him the same question. What, how should we live? What, what is the moral or ethical code that we should live by? And he simply said, love and do whatever you want. And just to qualify that, but by love, he didn't just meant have, have a feeling of affection towards something. He, he meant recognize that everyone and everything share their being. The, the essence of everyone and everything is the same, although everyone, it, we seem to see 10,000 things, but really it's all an appearance of one thing. That, that is what love is the collapse of the distinction between self and other. So what St. Augustine is saying is feel, understand, but more importantly, feel that you share your being with everyone and everything. Everyone is yourself. You are everyone and everything. Once you understand this and feel that, all that is necessary is to lead a life to the best of our ability that is consistent with that felt understanding. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks, Marty. Marty. Okay, so um, final question from the audience before I've got one last, and it's our mate Donal. I think he's just got something to share rather than question, but I'm going to ask you to unmute Donal and Rita over there in Ennis in Southern Ireland. Lovely people. How are you, Donal? Hello, Donald. <laughs> I'm sure with anybody, but I can talk, and that I can. And, and my, my question was rather facetious in a way. I said, I said, stepping back into the cascade of light within us reveals the peace and the happiness that we seek. So I said, is Guru greater than God? Because, but you, as you explained, God, you ought to mean, but not your concept. It's, it's your it's greater than our concept, our general concept of God. Because to me, uh, what I've been hearing from you and what I've been feeling from you is, uh, I use the word satsang, it's the company of truth, and that truth and that love. Is what yeah. I was told within Alcoholics Anonymous <clears throat> that, that I had to, I, I tried to go to a guru for to stop me from drinking and from drugs. And if I was to have peace, I was to do three things and it was a three like a three legged stool. It was satsang, service, and meditation. Satsang to me is the company of uh, all you guys, you know what I mean? And when you're sharing from that truth. Service is not looking for something in return. And meditation is 
looking at that life and being, being at peace and with, with the sound that's within, with, with, with breath that's within. Because to me, you know what I mean? Being in that love is where it's at, as far as I know. And that's the only way that I can be happy. It's being yeah. totally surrendered. And I don't know any other way. <laughs> Thanks, Donald, mate. It's lovely to see you. Thank Rupert, you. Just to... thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So, so thank you very much. Um, so we've just got the final question from me. I get to have the last word, which I love being an alcoholic. But this is it. So my question, this is just a little bit of fun. It's a bit of a Radio 4 question there, Rupert. I want you to pretend that you've just won millions and millions on the lottery. You are extremely rich and you buy a super luxury yacht and off you go on your round-the-world adventure. But a year into the round-the-world adventure, you're sailing in the tropics when your yacht hits some submerged rocks and you've only got seconds to get off boat. You've got a plastic bag and you've got your bookcase there full of all your most precious favourite books. You grab one book, you put it in the bag, you dive overboard and swim to the desert island. What's the book? Who wrote it and why? Oh! <laughs> 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 Yeah. It's a book by a um, Sufi mystic called Balayani. If you had an hour, I would be more than happy to read the whole thing to you. And in fact, um, could you give us a couple of verses? A close friend of mine um, has had, uh, for six months, he's been in the hospital with an incurable, uh, very unusual form of leukemia. And um, he wrote to me a couple of days ago and told me that he had taken his, um, they'd taken him off his life support machine and he just had a couple of days to live. So I got up very early one morning and I recorded the entirety of this book for him and sent it to him so that he could listen to it while he was dying. And I'm now going to read you a few lines from it. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise belongs to God, before whose oneness there is no before, unless the before is he. And after whose singleness there is no after, unless the after is he. He is. And there is not with him any before or after, above or below, closeness or distance, how or where or when, time or moment or duration, manifested existence or place. And he is now as he has always been. been. He is the one without oneness and the single without singleness. He is not composed of name, and named, for his name is him, and his named is him, and there is no name or named other than him. He is the first without firstness, and the last without lastness. He is the apparent without appearance, and the hidden without hiddenness. I mean, he is the very existence of the letters of the names, the first and the last, the apparent and the hidden. I'll just read a little bit more. Understand this so as not to make the mistake of those who believe in incarnation. He is not in anything, and there is no thing, and no thing is in him, whether entering into him or coming out of him. It is in this way that you should know him, and not through theoretical knowledge, reason, understanding, or conjecture, nor with the senses, the external eye, or interior sight or perception. No one sees him except himself. No one reaches him except himself. No one knows him except himself. He knows himself through himself, and he sees himself by means of himself alone. No one sees him, but no, no one but he sees him. His veil is his oneness, since nothing veils him other than him. His own being veils him. His being is concealed by his oneness without any condition. I could go on all night. That's the book I would take with me. It's called Know Yourself, An Explanation of the Oneness of Being. It's very short, 
you can read it in an hour. It is the essence of non-duality. And what is beautiful about it that all of you would appreciate is that it's, um, it's spoken in traditional religious language. So it speaks uh, uh, only of God. Who is the author again, would you mind, please? And, and the author is um, someone called Baliani, B-A-L-Y-A-N-I, Baliani. And it was um, translated from the Arabic by someone who lives just down the road from here, Celia Twinch, Cecilia Twinch. So that, that, that's, the, that's the book I would reach for as my boat went down. Beautiful. Well, listen, thank you very I feel... Um, an honor and so honored that you've come along here and i you know i just i just to say to everyone again uh, rupert's website he's got a load of books on non-duality which are beautiful um they can go to rupertspira.com he's got a youtube channel just just go into youtube and uh, search rupert spira they're fantastic i've spent hours and hours and hours of my life listening to this guy and i just it's certainly he's certainly shattered the, the the hard heart for me and um he played a big role and robert adams bizarrely so um which i didn't know about rupert which i didn't know that you'd been to see him so um i just thank you very much um and i think a big big applause hey everyone thank you very much yeah that was wonderful so, um well, awesome. thank, so, thank you thank you for inviting me it's a it, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you all and um, I'm very touched by your, your, your open hearts and your love of truth. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you very much, Rupert. Have a good evening and, and uh, namaste. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Cheers. Cheers now.